Good day, YouTubers, and welcome to another episode in the Northern Morton Bay series. This episode is going up out of sequence because my original intention was to do the Curtin Artificial Reef next, but the reason that that hasn't gone up, and also the reason that it's been quite a while since the last video in this series has gone up, is that I'm waiting for some copyright approvals on some images that I would like to use in the Curtin Artificial Reef video. The copyright approvals are taking a while to come through, I got some through, but I'm still waiting on some others. So I've decided to go ahead with this video on the Cowan area, and hopefully the approvals will come through and the Curtin Artificial Reef will go up next. If not, I'll continue up north towards Conbiore Point and come back to Curtin once the approvals are through. Or if they don't come through, I'll put the video together without those images. As I start this episode, the plan is to cover the area from Cowan Cowan Point up to Combiore Point. Now whether I get that far depends on how much I gas bag about the history of this area because it is an area that is rich in history. There's quite a few of you have commented that you like the history aspect of these episodes so I'm trying to add a little bit more in but I don't want to go overboard with it because it is basically a fishing channel so I'm going to try and do a little bit of both. The first settlement at Cowan Cowan was when they established the pilot station at Cowan Cowan Point in 1848. Prior to that the pilot station had been at Amity because the South Passage Bar was the main entrance into Moreton Bay at the time. In 1847 the Sovereign was lost while crossing the bar at the cost of 44 lives and after that incident it was decided that the South Passage entrance was too dangerous for general use and that everyone should be coming around the northern end of Morton. So they moved the pilot station up to Cowan Cowan. Later on it was moved up further north to Bulwa, but we'll get to that when I talk about Bulwa. The first lighthouse was built at Cowan Cowan Point in the early 1860s and it was a five and a half metre wooden tower with a kerosene lamp on top and a reflector to direct the light. In 1867 they extended the tower from five and a half metres up to ten metres and the fact that further upgrades were made in 1874, 1883 and 1899 indicate just how important the Cowan Cowan Lighthouse was to navigation in Moreton Bay in those days. But I find one of the most interesting things about the Cowan Cowan Lighthouse is that in 1898 they decided that erosion was going to be a problem and that eventually the lighthouse and the cottage would fall into the sea. So in 1901 they moved both the cottage and the lighthouse 200 metres inland to prevent that from happening. And when I talk about the fortifications that were built at Cowan Cowan for World War II, and we look at them today, you'll see just how big a problem erosion is in the area. In 1950, the light at Cowan Cowan was converted to acetylene gas. It was automated and the station was demanned. The light is still present today at the southern end of the airstrip for the Tangalima Resort and the airstrip has quite a few interesting stories in itself but I won't go into them because they're more hearsay than history. There's a lot of history around the area but what I want to concentrate on in this episode is the history of World War II as it relates to Cowan Cowan. There was an artillery battery established at Cowan Cowan at the beginning of the war that was to protect the entrances into Moreton Bay there's several other batteries around, as you can see, up at Bribey, Fort Lytton and Rouse. But the one on Cowan Cowan was on the western side of the island. So that's the only one I'm interested in at this point. I will cover some of the others in later videos in other series. There's two maps of Cowan Cowan here, separated in time by about 80 years. The one on the left shows the layout of the battery as it was in World War II. The one on the right shows the layout of Cowan Cowan as it is today. As you can see, there's not a lot of difference. The one thing I did notice was the names they've given to the streets, particularly Finnegan Street and Pamphlet Street. If you've watched some of the earlier videos in this series, you'll remember those names. They were two of the three convicts that were shipwrecked on Morton Island, and they were the first guys to actually see the site of Brisbane. Curious that they'd picked two of the names and not the third for the names of the street. This first set of pictures is from the Australian War Memorial. They have quite an extensive history of World War II and Australia's involvement. 
There's a lot of pictures as well as just general information. I'll put a link to their site in the description below in case you'd like to go and have a look at that. You might note that all of these pictures were taken on the 13th of the 11th, 1943, which incidentally was a Saturday. But the fact that they're all taken on the same day indicates that someone decided to send a photographer over to the island and take some pictures of what they do there. It looks typical of the sorts of things that the Allies published in the newspapers and magazines. They also did newsreels for the cinemas, just to show what the troops did on a day-to-day -day basis, try to encourage people to go and join, I suppose. Although, there wasn't much need for that because they did introduce conscription when the numbers weren't high enough. In any event, these pictures give us a fascinating look at life in the day. If you haven't ever seen any of the six inch shells that are fired by these guns, these couple of pictures here give you a very good idea of the size of them. They're quite a substantial piece of metal to be firing out of a gun. Not to mention the fact that they're packed with explosive. The troops built most of the fort themselves. Just feel free to pause the video and have a read of the captions. The captions I've got here are from the war memorial pictures. So it gives you the background behind the picture and also the names of the people involved. As you can probably imagine, life in an army unit that is behind the front lines is fairly routine and is made up a lot of just general maintenance and looking after the equipment. A friend of mine who was in the Navy once described it as join the Navy, see the world and learn how to paint ships. It wasn't all work though, they did have their own cinema and regular movie nights. And in this view of the interior of the control tower, the most notable things to me are the slit window that they look out of and the clock which seems to be highlighted on the wall due to the sunlight coming in the slit window. The whole idea behind the slit window is it's small and unlikely for a shell to get in there and explode inside the control tower. That was the theory anyway. And this is a picture of the plotting room where I guess they plotted the movement of all ships in Moreton Bay. That would be fairly important if one ship was sort of out of place, an enemy ship got in, they'd need to know where all the friendly ships were so they didn't shoot the wrong one, which did indeed happen at one point and I'll talk about that incident a little bit later. In this picture we see the gun crew ready around the gun, or posing for the picture at least. The thing that strikes me most about this picture is the guy that's standing like Urkel. If you don't know who Urkel is, he's a character in an American sitcom, and I can't for the life of me remember what the name of the sitcom was, but if you get the reference, you'll pick the guy out straight away. In this picture, just notice the guy carrying the six inch shell as tenderly as you would a baby. I imagine for the picture that the shell isn't fused, but in a real life situation, the fuse would be inserted in the shell and dropping it could be disastrous. And this is the officers group from the day of the picture. So I guess there was too many enlisted men to do a group photo of them. Interesting to note, there was enough men at the station to warrant having a couple of nurses there. This group of pictures is just some before and after shots from when the port was being constructed to what it looks like in more recent times. I'm just going to let these play through by themselves with some background music.
And this final group of pictures on Fort Cowan was all taken around the 2005 era and just shows how it has deteriorated over the years. And this is the Auxiliary Minesweeper Tambar, which was operating in Moreton Bay on the 4th of March 1942. And it was involved in an incident with the Cowan battery where there was a mix up with the code signals. And the Cowan battery was ordered to fire a shot across their bows to just alert them to the fact that there was a problem, I guess. Unfortunately, the Cowan battery missed and hit the ship itself. The shell struck the ship's forecastle, where it killed an able seaman who was part of the anchor party. The shell then skidded across the deck, struck the superstructure, and passed through the captain's cabin, where it killed the steward. Then it passed through the radio room, where it severed both legs of a warrant officer who was on duty, before it left the ship and plunged into the sea. The first two men were killed instantly, and the warrant officer died later in Greenslopes Hospital. I guess they were lucky that the shell didn't explode, or the casualty list would have been a lot longer. And because during the war an incident like this is considered bad for morale, the ship was paid off, the captain assigned to a new ship, and the crew dispersed around the Navy into other ships, presumably with orders not to discuss the incident. And that now brings us to the RAN's involvement in Port Cowan. They had a control station there which was moved from Combiore Point down to Port Cowan and that was responsible for controlling the minefields in Moreton Bay in the early parts of the war. It was later moved to another location, we'll talk about that in a later video. But yes, Moreton Bay was mined, it was mined extensively and the area around the east coast was also mined not only by our own people but also by Japanese and German ships. So there's quite a few mines around Australia and one of the things I remember about learning how to use the radio and passing my radio examination was the security call which was given as a practice example and that was to report a mine that had been sighted floating at sea. So back in the, I guess it was the late 60s, maybe early 70s, probably early 70s when I did it, mines were still a consideration that they might be left over from World War II. In fact, you can see in this one here, it's a German mine that washed up on a Gold Coast beach in the late 60s. It did sort of bring to the forefront of my mind that there's still leftover mines out there from World War II at that time, and you could find them. So the security call that was given as an example was perfectly valid. Yeah, I'm sorry, the history aspect of this video sort of ran away with me. I've managed to gas bag on a lot longer than I intended, but it's just so fascinating for me, so I hope you enjoyed it. Let's talk about some of the fishing in the area, and the first thing I want to talk about is collecting the bait. There's a lot of grass beds in the area, and they're marked here on this map. There's a fair chance of getting squid in any of them, so go and take a bait jig or take a light out and a cast net and try and get yourself some squid, some live squid for bait. It is excellent bait. Everything in the area will love it. Of course, if you choose to try and collect the squid with a cast net and a squid light, you need to be out there at night time, or at least when it's dark, so you either get out there very early in the morning when it's still dark so you can get your bait, or go out there the night before, collect your bait over night time and fish the following morning. If you do catch some squid for live bait, put your hook in the top of the hood, no more than a centimetre down from the point. If you're using a snell rig, do the same thing, put your top hook in the top of the hood, about a centimetre down from the point, 
and put your bottom hook through the side of the squid but make sure you don't go in very deep you just want to just pinch the side of the squid with the hook so that the hook doesn't go into anything vital you want to keep that squid alive as long as possible just to give you some bearing on where things are here the green dot there marks the rough position of the curtain artificial reef I've only got two marks here. The icon just north of the Curtin Artificial Reef that looks like an orange tower is one of mine, as is the Red Cross just north of that again. The other marks there are public marks that I've come across. I don't know how well they fish. I haven't got a sounder shot from my marks because I took these before I sort of got really organised on taking sounder shots and associating them with a mark in the computer program that I use. But given the icon that I put on that mark, I strongly suspect that there's either a pinnacle down there or a very substantial hill. Some piece of structure that you can't miss and should be good to fish on. But that's just on the basis of the icon that I used. The other mark that I have further north, I'm pretty sure that marks some ground where you can go and get some squid for bait. But again, this was done at a time where I wasn't very organised at doing this, so I could be wrong there as well. If we go across to the Navionics app, you can see there's a big drop off into the channel just a little to the west of the Curtin Artificial Reef and heading on up north towards Bulwar. Now I've drawn the green line there along that drop off and what I usually do when I'm up in that area is sound along that green line just sounding along the drop off and when I see some fish I stop and have a fish. I've actually done a lot better over the years fishing that drop off than I have recently trying the artificial reef. But one day I also hope to master the artificial reef. There's a couple of screenshots from my sounder here, just taken in the general area. There's nothing large enough on there to be worth stopping and trying to fish, but as you can see there's plenty of bait showing, and where there's bait there's large fish not very far away. So the idea is to just keep zigzagging along that drop off until you find them. I think the video is as long as I'd like to make it now. We didn't make it up to Bulwar or Combiore Point, but we'll make it up there in the near future. I did gas bag on a lot more about the history than I probably should have, but we've covered a lot of it in this episode. There's a little bit of history to come in the future episodes, but we've covered the majority of it, so there shouldn't be quite as much history and a little bit more on fishing in future episodes. All things going well, I'll upload the video on the Curtin Artificial Reef next. If not, we'll carry on to Bulwar and hopefully get back to the Curtin Artificial Reef in the video after that. As always, thank you for taking the time to watch this. I hope you got something out of it. I do hope you enjoyed the history. I know I went on a little bit overboard with it this time, but I'm guessing that a lot of the young fellas watching this wouldn't know some of the things that went on in World War II, like the depth charge practice. Must have been a good way to fish and the mishaps that occurred when the wrong ship was fired upon. And just the fact that Morton Bay used to be mined at that stage. All things being well, the next video in this series will be up in two or three weeks, and there'll be some other videos in the meantime. Until then, good fishing.